Well, my topic uh, tonight is uh, war, morality, and legitimacy. It's a small topic, really. <laughs> we should be able to dispatch with it in about an hour and a half. <laughs> anyway, I know that you would all prefer really to be talking about the hijacking of our government. So it's, it's really great that you're actually coming to talk about war tonight. Um, talking about war is an endless task, really, because we live in a society in an era of perpetual war. And the task before us is always try to understand it, understand how that war system works, what kind of a culture supports it, where the tensions are in that system, where there are openings. All these are critical questions, and uh, they take uh, sustained effort, really. Um, and I feel. Uh, as I imagine all of you do, even though you have been addressing this question probably most of your lives, a perpetual beginner in this task, uh, it is a difficult one. Uh, Rudolf Born famously said, the first casualty of war is truth. And uh, he had reasons for saying that, uh, because war is built on myth. And uh, there are, uh, myth is necessary because if the reasons of state, the political reasons of state, the economic reasons of state, the geopolitical reasons of state were known to the public, the reasons for going to war, um, there would be questions about those motives. So other reasons have to be proposed for going to war. Also, if the consequences of war were known to people, uh, war would be uh, difficult to accept. That is, if the truth of war were to be known, somehow known, witnessed, experienced, close up, imagined from inside the victims of war, both the soldier and the civilian victims of war, what do we turn to war so quickly? So war making relies on myth, not telling the truth of war. Ideas about the world, a myth, myth is a powerful thing. It involves, myth is about ideas about the world that carry some kind of moral authority. People believe in them and they authorize people to carry out certain actions. Myths are powerful, they're symbolic, they have deep roots in the culture. So what I'm arguing, first of all, a premise argument, you might say, is that myth is essential for war making. It's essential for war being perceived and experienced as legitimate. There are many myths that we could talk about that are part of the war culture. Uh, we could talk about uh, probably one of the most unassailable myths at all, of all in uh, American culture, I think which is the myth that a strong military is the bedrock of national security. That goes deep, and it's a long discussion about that, and there's a lot to say about it. There's also the myth of noble sacrifice. That is the idea that killing and being killed is somehow a sacred act. There's the myth about who we are as a nation and who we imagine our enemies to be. In every war, there are these kinds of myths about us and them. And of course, there's the well-known myth of American exceptionalism, the ideal that uh, America is represented, represents in the world ideals of freedom, keeping peace, democracy, and the like. My focus tonight is really going to be on uh, justifications for war. And justifications are understood classically in, in international law, in just war tradition, and two kinds of justifications. One is the justification for going to war, right? That is, use ad bellum is the, uh, is the term in international law. It is the justification, the reasons that are put forth, the claims of why war is necessary, why war is moral. 
And then uh, there is uh, the uh, myth of, uh, excuse me, uh, the justification of humanity in war. That is, wars themselves are humane acts. That wars uh, are legitimate and moral in the ways that they're fought, in the ways that they're carried out. So uh, I want to talk then about a core contradiction. I believe that if we try to understand the war system as it exists, that there, are, there is, on the one side, the everyday reality of war, which is brutal, terrorizing, and inhumane. Yet there exist, in opposition to this, widespread expectations, widespread expectations, expectations values, institutionalized and in international law about the humane limits to war. That is, specific acts of warfare cross a boundary and they are seen to be unacceptable. That uh, international norms are violated. That humane warfare then becomes critical for the legitimacy of fighting war. So on the one side, we have the everyday reality of war. And that is, I'm suggesting, inevitably inhumane. And on the other side, humane warfare, I believe, is essential for the legitimation of war. If the everyday of reality of war is inhumane, in fact, specific events will occur, events that will come to the public's attention or could come to the public's attention that would reveal or expose that inhumane reality. And so this becomes a problem for war makers that potential of exposure or the everyday or occasional reality of those exposures. So therefore, a core requirement of any nation at war, I would suggest, a core requirement is to manage that contradiction that I've just set out, the contradiction between the inhumane reality of war on the one side and the humane expectation of war on the other side. The unobstructed use of military power means, I suggest, that the reality of warfare must be hidden or when it is exposed, it must be handled in the least damaging way. My point is humane warfare becomes an essential myth of, warfare, of the warfare state of any warfare state. But it's also a vulnerable myth, which I'll also want to talk about. So let me just say, before I get to the vulnerability of the myth, let me just draw out my argument a little bit about the inhumane reality of war. This is not a fun topic to think about, but I believe a necessary one. I believe what drives war is what I would call a logic of force. It's a logic of pure instrumentality. It leads to a predisposition of combatants, any combatants, nation or non-nation, a predisposition to use all available means that are useful for achieving a political objective, the political objective that the war seeks to realize, irrespective of competing values. War is about sending a message, we are told. It's always about communication, and that message is that resistance to superior military power is too costly and ultimately futile. The objective in war is to inflict as much damage as possible on enemy forces, and by extension, on economic political, social resources that contribute to an enemy's ability or willingness to fight. The aim is to kill, wound, terrorize, incapacitate human beings. Either combatants 
or the civilians who support them. Entire societies become targets. What I'm saying and proposing to you is that war knows no limits. But I'm immediately going to qualify that. It knows no limits as long as there are no damaging political costs to the exercise of that force. Also, there are other kinds of limitations we could talk about, uh, the, the limitations that come from the demand of uh, reciprocity. If we don't torture your prisoners, you won't torture our prisoners. That would be a kind of reciprocity that nations agree upon, sometimes in order to limit the response. My point, if we were to be honest about the history of war, uh, we would recognize that war is a practice, a use of violence that is normally unhinged from prevailing values. And it is unhinged from prevailing or any attempts to limit war's brutality through law. This is not to say <coughs> that nations haven't adopted or observed limits to war. They have. Primarily, I would argue, precisely because of universal condemnation or near universal condemnation of particular acts of war, and that these become essential for legitimacy. There's even a paradox that one can what easily discover that nations promote humanitarian values and promote international humanitarian law and at the same time violate exactly what they're promoting. It's a very interesting paradox. My argument is also not to say that all warfare, any kind of warfare, is equally inhumane. There is some warfare, clearly, that is more inhumane than other kinds. I understand that some people might object to that proposition. Nonetheless, my assertion is that the logic of force is prior to morality. It is the default position of war. And I would further suggest that the laws of war are made in recognition of this logic. That the laws of war, those who form the laws of wars, recognize that the logic of force always pushes at the limits of restraint. There's a recognition that there's always a will to power in war. <clears throat> Historians have coined the phrase total warfare to describe the wars that know no limits. Sectorian, sectarian civil wars are a good example, race wars genocidal wars, colonial wars against nationalist movements. We know that history is full of brutal dictators with blood on their hands. But I suggest that there's perhaps too much comfort, too much comfort in blaming the inhumanity of wars on others. Too much of an exoneration is to focus solely on the brutality, for example, of America's enemies. Now, I also recognize if we were to take this honest history of war and hold the mirror up to ourselves, that many people, and perhaps most people in America, would have a very difficult time with that proposition, that America, too, commits inhumane acts and wars. First of all, nationalist, right-wing, most veteran group, veterans groups would be openly hostile to such efforts. One only has to remember the effort of the Smithsonian to show uh, the uh, exhibit on the Enola Gay in 1995 about the dropping of the uh, atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the kind of uprising of, a, uh, of opposition against that attempt 
I'll never forget a few years ago, several years ago now actually, when I was visiting my uncle who was a veteran of the Pacific War and suddenly grabbed me by the shoulder and I didn't know what I said, if I said anything, but he said, Rob, do you know that if we had not dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I would not be here today talking to you. We would have had to invade Japan, he said. This, this myth of uh, the uh, often said to be estimates of over 200,000 American casualties if the U.S. required to was required to invade Japan, it was used by Truman, it was used by subsequent presidents and justifications of the dropping of the bomb. So an honest history then would have to cover a lot of ground, uh, ground that I can't cover in such a short presentation here. We'd have to talk about World War II, uh, a war with extraordinary brutality on all sides, German war policy, extraordinarily brutal. Soviet war policy in response to Germans, extraordinarily brutal. But so was the British and American war policy. I give you the primary example of area bombing uh, of cities, the German and Japanese cities, and not just bombing, but fire bombing designed to create fires that would create firestorms, cause human fatalities. It was an early version of napalm that was actually used. And these uh, bombings occurred primarily by America in the Pacific, primarily by Britain in Europe, uh, and they caused hundreds of thousands of civilian deaths. And they were intended to. Of course, in the Pacific, that policy resulted in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We would also have to talk about the logic of the Cold War, which was, uh, continued this, this, this kind of total war paradigm. It was interesting that I found a quotation uh, in a secret 1954 report to President Eisenhower. It was the Doolittle Commission. Uh, and I want to just quote a phrase from this, and it was in reference to uh, the claim that the Soviet Union was seeking world domination. Quote, it is now clear that we are facing an implacable enemy whose avowed objective is world domination by whatever means and whatever cost. There are no rules to such a game. Hitherto, acceptable norms of human conduct do not apply. If the US is to survive, longstanding American concepts of fair play must be reconsidered. The nation must adopt tactics more ruthless than those employed by the enemy. Well, the history of the Cold War demonstrates that that was taken very seriously. It started first with the area bombing of North Korea, where again, if you know that history, and by the way, Korea for most of us is a forgotten history. Uh, there was massive bombing of North Korean cities uh, again, causing hundreds of thousands of civilians. In fact, the bombing of North Korea, in terms of the tonnage dropped on North Korea, was greater than the Pacific War. Uh, this was followed by, in the Vietnam War, area bombing of North Vietnam and Cambodia as well, and large areas of South Vietnam. The indiscriminate bomb bombing of cities, entire war zones, we're talking about the B-52 bombings, the use of Agent Orange, again the use of napalm. A close examine of the examination of the Vietnam War or the Indochina War, other total war tactics would have to also be discussed. We would have to talk about the pacification campaigns and what they really meant. We'd have to talk about something called the Phoenix Program which involved the assassination and torture of the, quote, civilian infrastructure of the Viet Cong. We'd have to talk about free fire zones, use of airstrikes calling in. Nick Terse has written a new book that you might, um, I, I shouldn't say enjoy reading. I, I doubt you would enjoy it, but it's an important book. It's called Kill Anything That Moves. 
we'd have to talk about Cold War counterinsurgency tactics that were used in covert warfare throughout the entire Cold War period. Assassination, overthrow, support for dictatorships, repression, death squads, School of the Americas, training of military personnel. And I would suggest uh, that the evidence is strong that uh, this paradigm has continued beyond the Cold War, the end of the Cold War. I have no time again here to review in detail some of the examples, but starting with the Gulf War, the Iraq War I, we should know about the highway of death, the retreating Iraqi soldiers, we should know about General Barry McCaffrey's massacre at Romalia, reported by Seymour Hirsch, after a ceasefire had been declared. We should know about the civilian casualties of bombing Iraq in the Gulf War, including the Amaria shelter with over 400 people killed. And thanks to Bert Sachs, who's here tonight, and many others, we all also, and many of you probably do know, about the murderous U.S.-led U.N. sanctions regime that resulted in the estimated deaths of over 500,000 children due to malnutrition-induced disease. And all of this is before 9-11. Now, before you run from the hall, uh, I think uh, I want to also tell you about the other side of this equation, the other side of the contradiction. And I'm serious in actually in terms of running from the hall because a really careful discussion of all of this is depressing, it's hard, uh, it's a difficult subject. I know that uh, in my anti-torture work, uh, for example, Talking about torture is something that a lot of people just don't want to talk about, even though they know it exists, even though that they know that they're strongly opposed to it. Talking about it and talking about how, how it came about, how, how it works, is something that people is, are too uh, uncomfortable with often to deal with. And I understand that. I'm not being critical, but it's, it's difficult stuff. It's difficult for me. But let me talk a little bit about humani humanitarian sensibilities, what I call humanitarian sensibilities. Uh, despite much evidence to the contrary, I believe that inhumanity in war troubles the human spirit. I believe that there is a, uh, and, uh, and I think I can substantiate that there is a growing public sentiment globally about inhumane warfare and the inhumane consequences of war. I think this new humanism is a response, in part, at least one response, to the unparalleled violence of the 20th century, which by one estimate resulted in 231 million civilian deaths, either directly or indirectly. I'm talking about the military violence of the 20th century. Following World War II, there was strong international support, including support from the American government, for the creation of a political and legal framework to limit war. The Nuremberg Trials, the Nuremberg Principles that came out of those trials, the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the concept of war crimes, the concept of crimes against humanity, the conventions against torture, the additional conventions, the Chemical Weapons Convention, later in the 1990s, the creation of the International Criminal Court, tribunals for war crimes in former U Yugoslavia and Rwanda. These are, have all been developments since World War II, and these developments have been significant developments. In the 1980s, and beyond, there has been a virtual revolution in the consciousness about human rights, what one author called a justice cascade. 
sh demonstrating that human rights violators are being brought to court all over the world. It took sometimes 20 years, 30 years to do it, but it's happening. I think one additional source of this new humanism is the shocking inhumanity of nuclear weapons, which created in response a worldwide movement against the ultimate and inhumane warfare, the wanton destruction of millions of people by nuclear weapons and the fallout from them. Humane proponents uh, of international humanitarian law hoped for a new regime that would limit sovereignty and potentially transform contemporary war. Sadly, it, it is an unrealized goal. The laws of war, at best, have been unevenly applied. And they even have become instruments of power. Accountability for war crimes is also an unrealized ideal, especially for, for powerful nations. It's legitimate to ask the question if the laws of war have actually limited or lessened the inhumanity of war, or they have served to give it cover. And besides, the very category of inhumane warfare suggests that there's another category we can call humane warfare which is something to I and many others would object. Yet, no government today seeking international recognition and respect can openly flaunt the international norms of humanitarian warfare. No nation can openly do that, not without widespread condemnation. All nations, in fact, I believe, claim to honor these norms. Moreover, there's been a system created of international, national, non-governmental organizations that track, report, publicly condemn violations of human rights and international humanitarian law. Humanitarian organizations, international organizations, many journalists, human rights attorneys, academics, now pay increasing attention to the violations of or alleged violations of humane ideals and laws related to war. So for states that rely on war, that use war as an instrument of policy, which is what we mean when we talk about living in a warfare system, for these states, the realities that I've just been talking about are a problem that needs solving, needs attention. And if we're talking about the American government, especially for the American government, because the American government portrays itself as a leader in the world in terms of, of a series of values, a whole series of values about humanity and human, humanitarian values, that we protect humanitarian values and humanitarian law. And indeed, since the 1990s, humanitarian ideals have actually come to be employed to justify war. So humanitarian intervention is the subject uh, that divides those of us who have humanitarian sensibilities about war. No one finds comfort in being a bystander to atrocities. Others worry about hijacking humanitarian motives for geopolitical ends. But the point I'm making here is that an era said to be governed by international norms and international humanitarian law, states must at least attempt to make the case that they are conforming to those international norms. Failure to convince significant publics that the nation upholds international norms invites damaging criticism, and that dam damaging criticism can mean a critical loss of support, either globally or domestically, for war. 
If in reality, war fighting is inhumane, as I'm suggesting that it is, maintaining legitimacy, therefore, requires presenting war in a way as what it is not, presenting war as what it is not. It requires a myth of humane warfare. There's much to say in so little time about the cultural dynamics and the political dynamics that compromise or undermine the humanitarian sensibility, which I believe is so profound and so widespread. We would have to talk about justifications for civilian deaths, including justifications that are difficult to acknowledge publicly, such as retribution. We would have to talk about the splitting, which I believe is essential to war, that is, the splitting which describes the enemy as brutal, without which it would be hard to fight many wars, other races as brutal, other ideologies as brutal, and we would also have to talk about the dehumanization of victims so that they become not a matter of concern. So there's much to say about how the dynamics, cultural dynamics, compromise or undermine the humanitarian sensibility. There's also, I think, much to say about how certain events war events break through the denials, break through the cover-ups, and become public. Atrocities. Atrocities that, one way to define what is an atrocity, atrocity is something that shocks the conscience, to use a phrase that's used in international law. Shocks the conscience. Uh, I would suggest, by the way, I've worked on, as I said, on the torture issue for several years now. I would suggest that um, the torture issue has been the biggest challenge to the legitimacy of war in the United States that has existed ever in this country. Uh, some might say, well, what about My Lai? Well, if you look at the history of My Lai massacre in the Vietnam War, it came to public understanding a couple years after it happened, and ultimately it was understood in terms, or framed in terms of individual soldiers acting in a brutal way, not as policy, and successfully framed that way. No other event that I know of other than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. No other event post-World War II has revealed that in an inhumane act of war, torture, a war crime, after all, was authorized at the highest levels of the US government by the president, by the vice president, by the secretary of defense. And that's extraordinary when you actually begin to think about the implications of that knowledge and how that knowledge has been reverberated around the world and what it did to the American polity for several years, is extraordinary. That's why I believe, by the way, that the challenge of that, what I call a legitimacy crisis, which started with Abu Ghraib, by the way, but really Abu Ghraib was relatively successfully handled by the government, managed, but Abu Ghraib sparked a whole series of revelations that built the torture crisis through 2006, mm -hmm. uh, seven, eight, and nine. And that's why I believe, by the way, that President Obama had to end torture whether or not he believed in it. I, can't, I don't know what's in Obama's mind. But politically, I argue that he had to end torture. It was a legitimacy. It was absolutely essential for the legitimacy of the United States and world affairs to end US torture. But it is also why 
President Obama said we have to look forward, not backward, and did everything in his power, successfully to date, to suppress any accountability for the commission of war crimes by those who authorize torture. <clears throat> So um, we would have to ask also, we're talking about all the things that how events come to shock the conscience and how, those, and how that sh shock, to the extent that it occurs, is transformed into some kind of political voice. We'd also have to ask questions about our soldiers and how they deal with the moral pain of what they experience or witness in war, and how that moral pain sometimes, under what conditions, can it be expressed by giving voice, political voice, oppositional voice. We would have to understand what motivated Joseph Darby, for example, to turn in the photos at Abu Ghraib. We would have to understand what motivated Chelsea Manning to reveal documents to WikiLeaks. We would have to know about many others who took courageous acts to oppose or to try to reveal acts that they witnessed or knew about, either up through the chain of command or going outside, as they often had to do outside the chain of command. We would also have to recognize the role of military lawyers who actually Many believe, in fact, dearly, and stand up for the laws of war and attempt to uphold them against strong opposition from their superiors, like Alberto Moro, Mora did, the chief legal counsel at Guantanamo, against Rumsfeld. So there's much to say about how the conditions of possibility of how these events can shock the conscious and how that moral outrage can take political form. And finally, there's much to say about government and media strategies for managing the contradiction. Because the powers that be certainly know that that contradiction exists. And there is a huge apparatus to control information, to manage information, and present information to the media to make a war appear as it is not, in fact. So we would have to talk about the control of information. We would have to talk about things like control of access to war zones for journalists. We would have to talk about the, in the intimidation that exists of independent journalists. We'd have to, of course, talk about cover-ups, the devaluation of victims, the arguments about bad apples, the emphasis on situational atrocities, that is where individuals go berserk, the denial of policy. We would have to especially talk in today's world about the ideology, I call it an ideology of precision weapons. The, 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 the claim that weapons only kill combatants and minimally, if at all, kill civilians that they can zero so precisely into their target that the question of inhumanity of these acts are put aside. So um, in the time remaining, which is about one minute, um, we're going to uh, turn to a discussion of uh, these propositions and uh, you're going to, I guess, break into groups uh, to do this. And so I have, uh, uh, you don't have to follow these question guides, but I have three questions for you that I personally would like to hear your response to. I mean, I want to hear your response to everything I've said, if I've outraged you, if I've shocked your conscience. <laughs> I want to hear that. But the three questions are this. Is it possible to build a politics for peace founded on the principle that war is inhumane. Is it possible? That is, that war constantly reveals itself as inhumane. 
Can the legitimacy of particular wars, this is the, all the same question, can the legitimacy of particular wars be brought into question around inhumane practices or war in general? Big question. So if you run out of time on that one, try this one. What would, uh, secondly, what would be the elements of such a politics? What would be necessary to make a, a, a politics around inhumane <coughs> warfare a viable politics? What would have to go into that? I have some ideas, but I bet you do too. And three, uh, and this is a question that I struggle with and struggle with even tonight in thinking about how I would talk to you folks about this subject, is how do we begin talking to others who perhaps are not as troubled as you or I might be about the inhumanity of war? How do we really start those conversations? How do we listen to them and engage in the kinds of conversation that Rich was talking about for the Common Good Cafe? Because people are troubled by inhumanity war and other people are not so troubled by it. And that is a reality of the culture in which we live. So thank you very much. Let me hear some of the things on your mind. I, I think most of the people in our group answered your first question, no. We don't think war can be solved on a political level. We think that it's, it's a symptom of a deeper problem uh, and that has to do with how people understand what human life is about, <coughs> how the kind of economics, uh, uh, you know, that can, can a nation like the United States exist without war? It, the way we operate, the answer we think, think was no. One other brief statement, you talked a lot about the mythology underlying war making. It strikes at least me that if you're going to be involved in peacemaking, that also requires a mythology. And the question is, is which mythology you want to relate to, right. whether that's true or false for you. Wow, great, great comment. Um, let me ask back, and I mean to you or anyone, um, if you think that a politics, uh, a peacemaking politics, can contribute to that deeper level of personal and cultural transformation that you're also talking about. And when I say political, of course, um, I probably am meaning cultural. Uh, it means engaging people in ideas. It means uh, talking about what happens in war, talking about what happens to our soldiers in war, about civilians, other soldiers, about the very nature of war. Uh, and um, I imagine it, uh, you know, the challenge, those elements of peacemaking, the paradigms, the, the logics, if you will, that are enough to challenge effectively or even begin to challenge the logics of war, uh, that there are many, many dimensions of it. And I would imagine that they would in some way feed each other. So, um, thoughts about that? Anyone? I would like to, to at least mention the word justice. If you want to avoid war, you have to actually have foundations based on justice. And justice includes a system agreed upon in advance for punishing the one who will violate the laws that govern the behavior of the community or the world, if you will. The reason we have wars in the world today is because there is no justice. America and any powerful entity at one point in time would allow itself to do whatever it is because it knows that it will not pay for the consequences of its action. Yeah. Without justice, you can never achieve peace. Um, no argument. Uh, uh, just one one question, though, um, is um, the killing of people, either soldiers or civilians, uh, in the name of um, economic, geopolitical goals, a uh, question of justice also? 
Justice is not only for one, but justice is economical, is environmental, is social, is yes. in every sense. Yeah. And it's human. It, it's the question of the human consequences of what we do. So that, you know, I'm not saying that to focus on the inhumanity of war fighting is sufficient in itself because we have to, I mean, that's just the one dimension that I focused on in my talk, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the claim of, hum, the myth of humane warfare that is so powerful. Uh, that would have to be also connected to the whole question of the myth of just cause to war, which, which covers up these claims, uh, that the, the issue that you're referring to about the injustice that motivates war and the, and the consequence of, of war. So I, I would suggest that ultimately uh, the inhumanity of practice of war is related to the question of the unjust causes of war and that the two are, have to be equally questioned. I mean, for example, uh, some might feel that there is actually just cause for some war. I mean, the whole Syrian intervention, the idea of humane intervention. You might, you might some people have argued, some people have argued that, uh, that there are just causes for the use of military force. And Syria might have been one, uh, Bosnia might have been one, Rwanda might have been one. I mean, that these, that, that uh, and some people talk about World War II in terms of, uh, you know, a just war in that sense. But these are claims for just cause. And I think we have to, at the same time, question whether, in fact, there are just causes. We have to debate that. But at the same time, as even if we acknowledge that we might disagree on just cause, we might be able to come together and agree on, on unjust consequences of war. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, when uh, uh, Malai Joya came to this area uh, for two visits, um, something that came out of my um, shepherding around and such um, and listening to her over and over, I kept on thinking, I wonder if all our activism for peace is as effective at actually stopping war as if we put it into educating girls all over the world. Which on the face of it has nothing to do with war. It's about learning how to read and write and stuff. Um, but it gets at the heart of our culture and changes the way we live our lives um, individually and in community. And I can't answer that question. Uh, it might be that we should quit rattling off about Hiroshima and torture and all this war geeky stuff that we love to talk about and get down to um, schools or get down to um, reforming business policies uh, so that they're more equitable worldwide or other changes that will, will change the culture and um, make war um, just more obviously not useful. I believe we're in a multi-generational struggle. And <coughs> education is at the heart of it, clearly. If we don't change the way we uh, teach our children about war, um, then we're always going to be, be behind on this question. And I agree with you also on the gender uh, dimension of what you're saying. War and masculinity have been connected for a long time. Um, but I also remember the gold of my ears and the Margaret Thatchers of the world. Um, so I'm not entirely comfortable with... Um, <laughs> sorry to do that. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, I think we're getting closer to turning off the faucet instead of mopping the floor. I've got to get at the root cause, and it, this can't be, uh, the things we're doing here, we're dealing with symptoms. The root cause is that uh, people, there needs to be a spiritual transformation of some kind. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Yes. Our society is built on, um, I think, three, three 
prongs. Uh, we have the economic that um, uh, cares for us, um, in, in, as we know. Uh, we have political structures and we have a cultural dynamic to all of society. And what these two people have just mentioned is very strong in the cultural world, education and religion. And what I believe is that um, war is built on, on a very heavy emphasis on economic structure. And as long as those who are in power have the money, uh, our, our wars are going to continue. Uh, I suspect that um, you and uh, you, ma'am, uh, yeah, Brenda, um, and many others, John, um, might think that uh, my grappling for a viable politics is um, overly partial. I, I can't help but think in practical terms um, when I think about uh, the elements of uh, what a viable peacemaking politics might include, what it requires, for example. I think of things like um, independent journalism, you know, a, a very small question, but a very big question, really. Uh, journalists who are free from the constraints of the media magnets. Um, because ultimately, w one of the essential ingredients of an effective politics is knowledge about what goes on in war. We have to, we have to get to the truth of war somehow. And, and so I believe that that it means alternative means of journalism. It means the, you know, uh, like ACLU work uh, to protect journalists from being intimidated. Um, it, uh, uh, including surveilled uh, by the government. Uh, it, it, you know, it means First Amendment rights for journalists and also for protesters, by the way, if anybody listened to Democracy Now! this morning. Um, we uh, unfettered access to war zones. Uh, you know the control of government over over the, the, the prosecution of war is extraordinary, and and uh, and there's mind control going on when they do that. And so I mean I understand what you're saying about basic tra spiritual transformations one on one, uh, but there's also politics. And um, I mean who would have who would have guessed? that, um, and I know I go back to Vietnam, but who would have guessed that such a powerful anti-war movement would have been created? Who would have, who would have thought it? Uh, and then something that came to be labeled the Vietnam Syndrome, that is the extraordinary reluctance of Americans to go to war in far off places because of what Vietnam represented to them. Who would have predicted that a million people would have showed up in New York in what was it, 1982, to protest nuclear weapons, and that there was a global movement against nuclear weapons. Uh, I mean, th these things don't stop war, but they're extraordinarily important in moving a culture to understand war in a different way. Uh, who would have predicted, I mean, even very small things like the church, I mean, the small things, but not so small, I think, the church committee that was created in the 1970s to limit uh, surveillance uh, and, and uh, check the covert power of the CIA and the FBI on Americans. Uh, who would have uh, thought, who would have guessed that a Congress, uh, a Congress, an American Congress, would have stayed active on the question of war and passed something called the Boland Amendment in the 1980s that restricted Reagan from using congressional funds to fund the war in Nicaragua. And then when the government went around the Bolan Amendment to investigate the government, who would have guessed that the Congress in 1998 fell just 10 votes short of closing down the School of the Americas? I mean, these things happen, and they happen over time. And uh, we now look at the Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence, and which has issued a report on CIA torture. It's still secret. Will it make a difference? Well, maybe, maybe not. But these things, I believe, uh, at a much more practical level, I understand, and limited, and uh, not maybe getting to the core issues that many of you are talking about. I understand those core issues, those transformations. But nonetheless, my question is, do, do these things 
contribute in some meaningful way. Uh, I guess I'd like to hear the second half of your presentation, which you didn't give, because I think what we're up against, a lot of people would, would agree in our society that war is terrible, it's hell, but the, what gets in the way is the same thing with our politics, and that's Tina. There is no other alternative in <coughs> certain situations, and we really need to, to talk more about the fact that most of the, the revolutions in the past century that were successful were nonviolent. That nonviolence is a force that most Americans don't really comprehend. And in fact, it can, it, it's a very effective way to defend a society if you know what you're doing. You, don't, you still die, you still suffer, but I don't think it has a dehumanizing effect that, that our current violent methods have. Thank you. I think that is crucial. And Weldon, I don't know if you want to speak to this, but I know that you've told me a lot about uh, the creative peacemaking alternatives that, that you know about. And you, you want to say anything? I, I would just identify, I think, two or three sources just thinking about that. One is uh, uh, a retired now Mennonite historian, uh, American history, Jim Young, who is a friend of mine, has written one on a nonviolent history of America. And, as look through, there is an other sort of level of stories that, that we don't know about ourselves. Um, the, the most important, part, the most formative one for me is another dear friend, John Paul Waterock, who works both at the theoretical level and at the practical level, is on moral imagination. And you mentioned the imagination. I think that's crucial in how we reimagine the possibilities. If we aren't imagining things, we're sure not going to create them. Right. Um, and then there, there are plenty of evidence now to show that nonviolence is actually more effective for creating nation states or resolving situations than war has ever been. And yet the prevailing presumption is that war is the only and ultimate effective means for resolving everything. It's simply not true. So we just have to keep working at all of those dimensions. All of those dimensions, including uh, uh, nonviolent peacekeeping uh, kinds of arrangements that might be international in scope. Yeah. yeah. I think here comes Rich. So I, let's go to Rob. Rob. Yeah. 